Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. On this episode, we will be discussing AMC Theater's new insanity, a new pricing plan, dumbasses, drama at the Yellowstone Ranch, knock at the cabin, our review of that, and our topic this week, just in time for Valentine's Day, why do we love an apocalypse? Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson, joining me today, I'm your fellow host, John Davenport. Hey, buddy, and this is the Half Hour Power Hour. I just, I love saying that part. Okay. That's on Patreon. So you can go to Patreon if you want to hear that. <laughs> Troy Heinrichs. Hello. And this is the half hour nap I took during the half hour power hour. <laughs> oh, <laughs> bullshit. Damn. Shade throw. Shade throw. <laughs> Wait, is it really boring? Uh, oh. Episode three was really good. I don't know what happened between episode three and episode four. You're not that great. <laughs> I bet he knew what he was talking about. I bet he read the format multiple times. I don't even use a format for that show. That feels right. But that's on Patreon if anybody <laughs> wants to check that out. Uh, Amanda won't be here. Her, she she has a power outage. She's always got something. I swear. I'm starting to think like she's flipping the breaker before the podcast every week. No, I, my favorite was that she was. She says, I'm on top of the house looking outside and there's power lines that are down. I'm like, you don't. You were still in the car. <laughs> So you're like, true statement. bullshit? <laughs> bullshit. I, I wouldn't say that out loud um, or to her face, but maybe behind her back. Because you're afraid. Remember, you can always find more information at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Join our Facebook group, at The Hollywood Outsider. It's a private group. You got to look for it. Or we're on Twitter at Buy Popcorn. And also, I just want to mention before we get into it, as fans of the original, I know Troy and I are, I think John is as well. Just want to mention that I Know What You Did Last Summer is getting a sequel directed by Jennifer Caton Robinson, who did Do Revenge on Netflix, and starring Jennifer Love Hewitt and Freddie Prince Jr. They're coming back to another another legacy sequel, also written by MFA's Leah McKendrick, who we've interviewed on this very podcast. She's great. So I'm looking forward to that. So now the question becomes, like, how does this relate to the TV show? Because now is the TV show... Part of the canon, doesn't. or is the TV show not nope, part of the it canon? It doesn't. Nope. It, All, no. So the two movies, with, so I assume yeah. maybe Brandy can come back because she lived in that second one. So it's just, there's three movies. and Don't ever bring up that TV show. There's something good about that TV show. None of them are all the right reasons to like it, uh, but I the rest it. of it. I liked it. Enough. It, was pretty, huh? it was pretty decent enough. It made yeah. it all the way to the end. Well, I made it all the way to the end, but the ending really craps the bed. So, <laughs> kind of does. <laughs> but it was like, like, oh yeah, that's where they went. Okay. Yeah, it. I mean, it really. It had a lot of great things going for it, and then it just craps the bed at the end. So I was not really digging it. I didn't like overall. The experience was both good and frustrating, which is um, the title of my sex tape. I freaking knew that was coming. I literally saw. I heard that <laughs> joke in my head, and I'm like, here it comes. Title of my sex tape. Here it comes. Here it comes. We're going to move forward. This is the big news. Bombshell. AMC Theaters. Congratulations on finding a new way to piss everybody off about movie theaters just when we were starting to get people excited about them again. You dumbasses. Anyway, AMC is rolling out Sightline at AMC. In case you haven't heard about this, it's a ticket pricing initiative based on seat location within the auditorium. Similar to music concerts, sporting events, Broadway, moviegoers will have the option to pay more or less for admission, depending on where they choose to sit in the venue. In effect, front row seats will be available at a lower price because nobody wants front row, while seats in the middle of the theater will be available at a higher price because of those ones that people want immediately. Now, hang on before we talk about this because I want to explain this nonsense. I mean, this great business choice. You can kind of see where I'm leaning on this. There will be three different seat pricing options. The first is standard sight line, described as the seats that are the most common in auditoriums and are available for the traditional cost of a ticket. Then there's value sight line, referred to as seats in the middle row of the auditorium, as well as select ADA seats in each auditorium, and are available at a lower price than standard sight line seats. Those might be the front row seats, not the middle row seats. I'm just going by what what they, they rolled out. But you um, wrote front row, and then you said middle row. <laughs> whatever it says. Who, who doesn't read the format now? I'm <laughs> literally reading it word for word. Apparently not. <laughs> Where? What are you talking about? I don't understand what you're saying. It. 
No, you said there, then there's value sightline referred to as seats in the middle row of the auditorium, as well as select ADA seats. Oh, let me try this again. <laughs> then there's value sightline referred to as seats in the middle row. Hmm. I did you said that. it again. <laughs> <laughs> then there's value sightline referred to as seats in the front row of the auditorium, as well as select ADA seats in each auditorium and are available at a lower cost than standard sightline seats. The third option is preferred sightline, which are the seats in the middle of the auditorium and are priced at a premium to standard sightline seats. This is a lot. AMC Stubbs A-list members will be able to reserve seats in the preferred sightline section at no additional cost. That's where they say right now. So, okay, that's all that. Where do you guys sit with this new pricing endeavor before we get into pros and cons? Kill it with fire? Is that an option? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it is. It's an illegal one. This, I mean, this this sounds ridiculous. I can't. It, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a money grab for whatever the reason is for this money grab. I don't understand it. Um, I've never seen anything like this when it comes to a movie theater or at all. When it comes to seeing a live venue, okay, well, it's a live venue. That's one thing. You 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 kind of expect to see differences in prices because you're paying more to see the live person that you're paying right there in front of you. But when it comes to seeing a movie, you get what you get and it's all the same price. I, it just seems idiotic. I have no opinion on the matter because I am an A-list subscriber. <laughs> Come on, don't check it out. That's because you have an opposite view, isn't it? That's what it is. Well, <laughs> you're you, afraid say to discuss, say it. You, I, you, you said we were waiting to discuss the pros and cons. I'm, but uh, first of all, I just asked, where do you land on it? Do you think it's as bad as people are making it out to be, or you think it's not as bad as people are making it no, out No, there's, there's a reason why, right over here behind me, there is my chair, because my chair is directly in front of the television. And when people come over and sit on the couch, they do not have as good of a viewing experience as they would from my chair. So yes, I think this is a good business move on AMC's part, because it is how it's done for Broadway shows, which are also two and a half hours long. And I think that where they're going to fall down is how they price it or where they price it at. If the premium is like $20, they're going to lose people. But if the premium's like $12 and the front row is like six or seven bucks, then yeah, then you're getting no, the, the difference talking. in the, in the thing. So you have to price it in order for this to work. You have to price it the right way. This, uh, you guys can take notes, a rare occasion where I completely agree with Troy in that regard. Um, if they do price it ridiculous, like at 20 bucks a ticket, no way this works long term. No way in hell. No way it works no long term. Uh, if you it's 20 bucks it, to buy the movie and I can watch it as many times as I want from the chair that is seven feet from my TV. It's true. Still never going to be section. the same experience, but you know, that's a whole different debate. So I, 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 I see the pros and cons. So let's discuss the cons. We'll do cons first so we can go to the pro. We can end on the positives, right? So here are the cons as I see them. As Elijah Wood put it himself, the movie theater is and always has been a sacred democratic space for all. This change would essentially penalize people for lower income and reward for higher income. That is definitely a way to look at it. But it's never been that way from a fully democratized experience because when the tall six foot dude sat in front of me in the old school theaters and I couldn't see because I was a 10 year old kid, I didn't feel very much included in the movie viewing experience i feel the like tall people should have had to sit in the back <laughs> you're stretching now <laughs> i think you're stretching now and, you know, and i am gonna see it differently than when troy does because i don't see it the same as a broadway or a concert because if you go to those things well number one you go to a broadway show two or three hundred seats no that's not going to be the, the standard for a broadway show it's going to be thousands of people so that's a big difference so you have a much wider auditorium a deeper auditorium two levels usually and you know, when you're talking about there's also security, who's going to police this? Who will police this? Because no security is going to be available at the theater. You know that for a fact. So if somebody's in the wrong seat, and again, I say, no, I don't think it's like Broadway show or concert, but I understand where you're coming from because they even say that it's like that. But if if somebody, if I'm paying for a premium, even if I'm A-list, I'm, I'm paying for that preferred seating. So if I see somebody from the lower tier bop down to the preferred seating after the movie starts, I'm pissed. I'm pissed because you basically, you know, you're, you're kind of gimping the system. I don't like that. It's just like people sneaking in the movie. I don't like you either, <laughs> but nobody's going to police it because there's just teenagers working at the, at the theater and they barely get, tell people to get off their phones. 
the counter to that is that it's happened that way for all of all of time. When there's empty seats that are down by the diamond but for a baseball a game and you bought the upper deck, sure. they go down there and fill them up after the second or third inning because and they're not coming to those seats. They have security at those events, though. They have security. There is no security at AMC only, Theater. Only for like the, the, the you know, dugout to most dugout section. <laughs> they definitely... No, I've seen people get kicked out and moved move seats plenty of times at games, football games, baseball games, uh, concerts, Broadway shows, all of them, all of them. And I, and I do think, that's my, my other point, as much as they are including A-list now, I wonder, are they going to phase out A-list once this really happens? Will there be new tiers? Will you be paying extra for that preferred seating down the road? I'm like, I think you're kidding yourself if you think A-list won't change with this. Oh, yeah. A-list is going to twenty nine ninety nine a month. That's what I think. You think what? It's going to twenty nine ninety nine a month. Yeah, I could see that. Which is fairly close to the $40 you used to pay for MoviePass. That before is true. Movie Pass was before Movie Pass got stupid. I have a number in my head that I'm willing to go up to, and yeah, I I did it for Movie Pass before before it was ten bucks, and I would I would do it again. John, you're awful quiet. Well, the reason why I'm quiet is because I've already said I don't like this idea. I think this idea is stupid. I like I, I agree with you when you say there's nobody there to really re- really police this. This goes along with when it came to assigned seating, and everyone was doing assigned seating. There were times where fights would break out because people wouldn't give up seats that they were that were not assigned to them, and so I can see the same sort of thing happening here. On the flip side. I've mentioned before where there's a specific theater I like to go to. There's a premium that I have to pay to go to that theater because uh, of the the style of movie theater it is because it is a a movie theater in which you get a, basically a couch to yourself and you get a table in front of you and they bring you beer and food and all those other things. It's worth paying a premium the- for. Yeah, Elijah Wood sits next to you because he's in that upper class as well. Right. So, <laughs> you know like, he, that's- you know he ain't taking the value ticket. <laughs> and the other, and the thing is, is that you know that theater. No matter what seat you're in, you're in a good seat. There's if you're in the front row, you're in a good seat. If you're in the back row, you're in the good seat. There's no such thing as bad seating in that theater. So uh, I can't. I disagree. With you. I've been to that theater, and I do not believe that at all. But yeah, you continue. There's, there's still better seats. Than <laughs> there's others. always an optimal okay. seating area. Always. No matter I mean, there is an are. optimal seating area, but if you don't get the optimal seating area, you're not suffering like you would in in a normal theater where you're right underneath the screen, and every time you want to see a car go by really fast, you're going to damn near break your neck. Like that's not going to happen in that in this in this theater, you know. But then my point is, is that. I mean, in theory, I don't mind paying a premium. I like paying the premium to go to the theater that I like to go to. But when it comes to going to an everyday theater where they don't really clean up after themselves, the seats aren't nearly as comfortable. They don't bring me beer when I snap my fingers. I don't think that's a good place to be building out this 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 program. And I think the challenge here is that like, you go to the AMC by my house. We have the IMAX theater, which has, you know, 400 some seats in it. And then you have the... Dobly AMC Prime mm-hmm. Theater. Those are always worth a premium. Yep. 200 seats, maybe a little under 200 seats, maybe 180. But the rest of the theaters in that building, you might fit 30 people in the auditorium if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. So in that size of a theater, this doesn't make sense because it's literally six across. And that's a lot of them. Yeah. It's like, it's like four seats are $11 and two seats are... Thirteen dollars just because you got to be in the middle. I, I don't consider that to be a bonus. <laughs> I got to sit. I got to sit next to people on either side of me. <laughs> and yeah, agreed. And in the smaller theaters, it makes even less sense. And maybe, maybe they work that in. And da 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 da. But I, I go in now, and there, there's a sign seating, right? And people are hopping seats left and right. Now, granted, they have kind of said that you can do that through COVID because a lot of people were uncomfortable being too close to people. Okay, fine. As long as when the movie starts and there's nobody in those seats, then you can move there. Da, 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 da. But you start paying a premium. I think I think you're antagonizing people because people that pay less are going to be very, very upset if they see people sneaking into those preferred seats that they didn't that they couldn't afford for whatever reason. You know, and you're and I also think people in those lesser seats because they couldn't afford them are going to look at those people like assholes. Even though they're not, even though you're not, it doesn't make you an asshole to pay for a prefer, premium seat. They're going to look at them that way. They're going to feel that way. It's going to make them have a lesser experience, I think, from a con perspective. Well, we should make sure that we let people understand that 
just because they're in the cheap seats doesn't mean they can't afford the more expensive seats. No, I didn't. That's, I never said that. I didn't say you couldn't have. But it, but I, there will be many people you, that can. You said that they couldn't afford those seats, and that's why they're moving to them. Dude, I was no. poor. That's not what I said. I said people in those seats will be looking at that. Yeah, I'm sorry, John. I didn't mean to cut you off. Right. Because, because the rich also, people, you know, you know how the rich people get richer is that they buy those value seats because they can afford the other ones and then they just go sit in the other ones anyway. Uh, it, was, it was Elijah Wood who said that people can either can afford or cannot afford and how it creates this whole thing. It wasn't Aaron. Well, Aaron said it. Play back the tape. I repeated it. But repeated also, it. I grew but up poor. And I would, I would have to take those value seats. So I would be sitting in those seats going, feeling lesser than. And to me, a movie's always been kind of the equal communal experience. Always. It's the one thing where we're all the same walking in. Some people are bigger a-holes with their phones, blah, blah, blah. But we're all the same when we walk in a movie theater. It's not like when I go to a football concert and I can see people that obviously have more money than me everywhere. Where I can go to a concert and see people that have more money than me everywhere. All of that, to me, matters. It really does. Because to me, a movie theater is an even equal experience and you're taking that away and making it just another class warfare. But is it really equal and even when the A-listers can basically come in immediately when the tickets go on sale and reserve like everyone can, they, they can't reserve weekends? them before anybody else. No, but I can reserve those premium seats and then AMC is not going to get their money. AMC A-listers should band together and stand with Nicole Kidman and sit in all the premium seats. So AMC doesn't get a dime. <laughs> All that means is to just raise the prices a lot faster. Uh, all right. Well, we spent a lot of time on the cons. How about the pros? So, Troy, you obviously have some pros. What are your pros for, for this? Well, the, I mean, the pros are is that it gives more people the ability to go to a movie because every ticket is ridiculously priced at this point. I should not have to pay $10 to have neck injuries and sue AMC for my injuries because of that. Because I'm trying to watch the cars that go by that John explained. Um, I think that sitting in the floor versus the theater part, the, the the stadium seating part of it. I think there definitely should be a price difference for floor versus stadium. Now, whether or not side of the stadium versus the center of the stadium should be different price. I, I don't think that's really fair because I think unless you're in the corner, like most of those seats are just fine, but yeah, definitely on the floor versus the stadium. I could see that being a price breakdown and I think it's a good move for AMC to try to make some additional money because people are coming back to the theaters and, you know, a lot of times I don't, I don't want to buy concessions anymore because the movies are so damn long. So it's like, I'd rather just eat beforehand or eat afterwards. And then they're losing money at the concession stands. Maybe so I got to make up the money at the box office. You would think you'd want to eat more because you're there longer. No, because I got to get up and use the shitter and go to the bathroom <laughs> and miss the movie. I don't know if movies are really that much Unless longer. they're flying over the water. I will tell you a very, uh, miss understood metric that is just not the case is that movie tickets are not grossly overpriced compared to years ago. They're actually very much in line. Uh, in the last 10 years, the price, the average movie ticket price, now keep in mind, it's average, gone from 796 to 916. It's gone up a little over a buck in 10 years. I'm, I'm sorry, in the paid, last 10 I'm years. I'm not paid 916 for a ticket in like 10 years. It depends on when you go, man. A lot of that has to do with when you decide to go. If you decide to go to the night show uh, opening weekend, you're going to pay more, sure. But if you are someone who balances their their budget and whatnot and you go on the matinee or you get A-list, it's cheaper. So the, this kind of price is – the price of a movie ticket has not gone up as much as people like to say. Concessions, different. That's gone up a little bit more. But in terms of a movie ticket price, it has not gone up exponentially. We've already been paying the premium for IMAX and Dobley, which are the only two theaters Do I would ever Dobley? go see a movie in. Dobley? Do what is this, Harry Do Potter's Do elf? Dobley? What the? <laughs> Do Dolby? <laughs> Either way, I'm paying for the premium format because that's the only reason I'm going to the theater is to see the premium format. Well, that's you, so but, now, but not everybody is like you, you know? Right. Not everybody does that. That's why the prefer that's why the preferred sight line doesn't make sense for a 30-seat theater. It's small. But other other pros it could drive up A-list subscriptions because, you know, people will maybe see the benefit. And I do think A-list is a hell of a deal. If you go even more than – if you go to a movie twice, twice or more a month, it's a deal. It's a deal. Or more than twice a month. And I, I definitely do. I go every single week, sometimes a couple times a week. And it may it may include value for some people that can't afford to go as often like you were talking about, Trey. If, if they are very smart about the pricing and don't go crazy with it. If they keep the prices similar to what they are now, it's just basically a discounted version. So maybe they're just trying to sell those seats that they never sell. 
maybe that that's a benefit. Maybe. So this is very similar to like what I used to do radio sales. And so radio sales, obviously your in your inventory, your airtime, you sell morning drive, afternoon drive. Those are typically your most expensive time slots on the radio. So what we ended up doing is saying like, well, you know, people don't want to pay the premium price for the morning drive slow show. So why don't we make like tiers? So we had a 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. tier where you had a chance for your commercial to be aired in the morning show. And then we had an 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. tier and then a 4 p.m. to midnight tier. And then the two, the bread of the day, right? The two slices of bread were like $12 for an ad in the small market. And then the middle of the day, because it was also an at work station, was $25 for the ad. So it's kind of like the same concept where you're still paying for a premium. And that's what I think the AMC is saying is that you're paying for a premium to sit in the middle of the theater. And I don't think that that's a bad business decision. I think that what they should be doing is focusing on how I can take my A-list subscription and make it for the family so that I can go to have four people go to the theater on an A-list subscription once or twice a month. Like instead of giving me three movies for me, cause I'm never going to go see three movies in the weekend. You just give me, you refuse, just give me credits. you refuse to stay on topic. Cause you're just, you're Troy's just like, we're only going to talk about things that affect me. Right, John, yeah. am I wrong about this? Am I hearing this correctly? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, that's why I tuned half of what he said out at this point. <laughs> I, I'm, the pros are is that everybody Troy. We're talking about everybody, not yeah, just the, Troy the, Heinrich. The, pro, the pros are is that you pay for value. We all pay for no commercials, right? We pay extra. Like I want, you know, the biggie size fries and the biggie size drink, whatever. We pay extra. It's like paying extra is something that Americans that are in a capitalist society tend to do all the time. So AMC is just saying, like, how can we get them to pay extra? Here's an idea. Yeah. And I think they're wrong. I think they're wrong. But time will tell. I mean, they were just just getting some good traction, man. And I would say, I mean, no matter how you feel about it, I think the response from everything I've seen is overwhelmingly negative. People are not liking this. Well, that's because the only place we've heard about it is on the Internet. And the Internet is overly negative. <laughs> it's true. But they're only doing it in a few markets. They haven't actually rolled that out everywhere yet. But it will be coming by the end of this year. So it will be coming to your town and everybody will have an opinion for sure by then. Time to move on to Yellowstone. Well, actually, I'm really talking about universe building. But as of this recording, there is no final decision. But Deadline initially reported that Yellowstone might be coming to a close so far as Kevin Costner leading it is concerned. Uh, Paramount has said that's not necessarily true. We hope to still do business with Kevin Costner for a while. Apparently, they're... There was a preference for him for less shooting time than what the show requires because he still wants to make movies. So him and Taylor Sheridan are going to duke that out. Maybe it'll be settled by the time you hear this. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But now that that means he could just leave the series or they extend it in another way. Either way, Yellowstone is going to be fine because they built this whole universe. And we do know that Matthew McConaughey will star in Bass Reeves, yet another of the Taylor Sheridan's universe spinoffs like 1923 and 1883. So all of that. Maybe, oh, maybe Kevin Costner will have a kid and they can just extend it with the kid like some other show. You've obviously never seen Yellowstone. He's got like four kids. <laughs> <laughs> if there's anything he's good at, it's making kids. Yeah. yeah maybe but, one of his kids will be the one that extends the show like some other I'm, show. I'm sure. His, his daughter's a firecracker, so she'll probably be in charge. She'll probably murder everybody, but she'll be in charge. So of all of that brings me to my question. We are also now getting multiple spinoffs of Dexter and Billions, as well as Game of Thrones and so many other shows. Uh, Bosch just announced uh, two spinoffs of that show. <laughs> so what do you think of this CSI type expansion of universes everywhere that it used to be pretty much just pretty standard genre fare and we just would get a crime show and then we get another crime show. That's completely different. Now everything is connected. How do you guys feel about this? John, you've been quiet. Why don't you go first? <laughs> well, it's something that I find it's it's both good but exhausting. You know, it's you know, you kind of don't want to get on TV and then watch fifteen of the same show. Only oh, well, this one follows this character, and this show follows that character, and it, and it becomes very or overly formulaic. It becomes easy to figure out, and storytelling it kind of suffers a lot from it. On the flip side, if they're doing a good job, let's say. Um, Game of Thrones. Uh, I didn't finish the, the the most the most recent season, but let's just say uh, that 
you had a great series of Game of Thrones, and then they have now expanded the universe by giving us um, House of the Dragon. That's the one, uh, and <laughs> and it has its its benefits, and it's telling a good, solid story. So I think. If you're going to do this, do it for all the right reasons. Don't do it for the let's just use name recognition. Do it because there's there is an actual story to expand on. Doing a story on Dexter's Harrison as opposed to doing one on Dexter. It seems a little like it's going to be derivative of what Dexter actually is, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll do something that has its own expansion to it because he's going to be a younger character, then he's going to be uh seeing more of the way Dexter was before he became the blood And he was flat, more he's more extra. conflicted. Harrison is more conflicted about killing than Dexter is. Right. Right. So all, overall, there's a there's a lot of good ways to mine some great storytelling here. So I'm on the side of it's cool so long as you do the right thing with it and don't just control C, control V your way through this all. I'm okay with universe building if the universes are connected, but the shows are different. And I hate, I don't like saying that House of Dragon was a spinoff. It's, it's no different than George Lucas saying, I have this really great nine episode saga, but the best parts are in the middle. So we got the Game of Thrones that was the middle, and now we're just getting the prequels of Game of Thrones, and then eventually we'll get the Jon Snow future looking right. thing, which will be the which will be the seven eight nine of Star Wars. And I, I think as long as it's in universe, it makes sense. Um, that one that's coming to Amazon Prime, where they're doing like six different parts of the country and having like a Prime show, but then having all the other sub Italian, you know, Italian job and the Russian job and whatever in Spain job. Um, I think that's that's interesting because then you can see different parts of how it's all be like we've always said like what the hell's happening in Europe during the Walking Dead, right? Like there's a whole other piece of the continent that we could explore stories with that could be good stories, you know, definitely better than the kids of the Walking Dead, whatever the hell that show was. But yeah, universe building I think is cool. It just don't give me the same show. That's why Blacklist Redemption failed because it was the same show, even though the the, the buddy cop portion of that was actually decent like just be buddy cops and do a buddy cop show you brought up the walking dead here's the reason why you're not going to see the walking dead in, in england or france or any of those other places because the only way to make it a different show is to show them being more successful at it and there's no way any americans going to be like that's not going to happen true maybe it's the rise of europe because see europe was decimated in the world war and america thrived and now that it's all an even playing field again europe actually comes to power and takes over and they're the ones that find the vaccine. There you go. That could work. I'm, I'm fine with universe expansion. Maybe they're the ones in the helicopter that picked up Rick. I, I'm okay with universe expansion. I mean, people don't realize we've had this forever. I mean, CSI did it. NCIS has been doing it. I mean, you've got... Chicago. Chicago, everything. Every first Facts responder. Facts of life. Facts of life? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a spinoff of Different Strokes, right? Or something like that? It is a yeah. spinoff of Different Strokes. So they've been doing it for the Jeffersons is a spinoff of something. All in the Family, um, maybe? All in the Family. All in the Family. Yeah. Uh-huh. So this isn't new. It just It's new to this kind of TV, I feel like. I just, I don't recall it ever being done so much. But now, man, it, people, recognition is the name of the game, right? So if you recognize it, they're all about it. And that's what Johnny sells. loves Chachi. That sucked. God, that sucked. I I never watched it. I'm just going through off off the top of my head what other shows. Uh, Mork and Mindy. That was wonderful. Laverne and Shirley. Laverne and Shirley. Sure. My God. What are we even bitching about? This has been going on way more than I even. <laughs> this has been figured. going on for shut, We should shut years. the hell up. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Universes are great. Let's keep doing it. That That seems to be what we like. Right. Who knew? Who knew? All right. Now I just about 27 more of them came to my mind. God damn it. All right. Well, our show is independently funded. Therefore, all of the expenses are from our own pockets. Patreon helps fans support the favorite podcast. Once again, once you sign up, you get immediate access to all of the content in your respective tier, including John is covering The Last of Us episode by episode with the Half Hour Power Hour. That's a show that he was referencing earlier. Now that you understand this and you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. That's patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. New episodes drop right after those episodes air or shortly thereafter. So check it out. Holy Ma- crap. I just realized that Family Matters is a spinoff of Perfect Strangers. The From mom. Balky? I think the, yeah, I think, yeah, the Balky show spun off the Urkel show because the mom in the elevator 
in Perfect Strangers, I think, becomes the mom in Family Matters. I think the mom is the connection. Look it up. John's looking it up. It's true. Son of a bitch. No, I, yeah, I, I wasn't looking it up because... Um, I was looking it up. I didn't... Because <laughs> I'm like, no, no. All right. Well, there we go. One more. Now we're, we're going to think about it. Oh, Frasier. Frasier's a spinoff of Cheers. Frasier, yeah. I knew Frasier. Frasier. Mm-hmm. Are we just going to play this game for a while? Are we going to do that or are we going to move on? <laughs> this is a new fun game or could we or we can talk about Knock at the Cabin. Let's do Knock at the Cabin, <laughs> Troy. Well, Knock at the Cabin is not this year's old, uh, but it is M. Night Shyamalan coming back again for another fun trip to the movie theaters to see what twist he's going to come up with. And this one is taking place at a remote cabin where people are vacationing. A young girl and her parents taken hostage by four armed strangers who demand that the family make an unthinkable choice to avert the apocalypse. With limited access to the outside world, the family must decide what they believe before all is lost. Why would someone want to go see this film? Knowing that it's M. Night Shyamalan and he's like not been on a good track lately except for Servant, which has actually been doing really well, and he probably should go to TV instead of movies. What what drew you to say, yes, I'm going to go check this out, Aaron? Dave Batista, honestly. I'm kind of burned out on M. Night. Um, but Dave Batista, I have I have been very impressed, and I think maybe you guys will agree. I don't know. But in terms of wrestler turned actor, which I don't think is a fair moniker, he's an actor. <laughs> God knows all wrestlers are actors anyway. But... He he has been doing everything he can to expand his his art. I mean, he's really trying to grow as an artist. So when he does something, I feel like he's at least trying to grow as a performer. You know, where The Rock is, I we've talked about this. We all love The Rock, but he's the same guy in every damn movie, right? Doesn't change. And that's fine. Some movie stars do Harrison Ford, the same guy in every movie, and I love him too. It's it's nice to see someone of especially Batista's stature trying to do something different, trying to kind of grow and play different characters and, and evolve. And and he's doing a good job. So he's what drew me to this one. And I, and I like the idea, the idea that four strangers come knock at their door while this uh, gay couple and their daughter are at this cabin. And they basically say, you make a choice. You have to sacrifice one of you or the world ends. And then you have little, items to verify if they're telling the truth or not. And you have to wonder, are they telling the truth or not? It, us as film goers have to wonder, are they telling the truth or not? That's what Jeremy I mean, was Batista, but it's, I thought it was the, the hour and 40 minute runtime. Cause I was like, man, <laughs> no. this one's short. No, it's <laughs> I the, can watch it twice. <laughs> it's the Batista and, and the story. Uh, what is the story? I mean, what is the, what is the crux? I just of told you the story. Random opus. That's it. They have to choose one of them has to, one of, they have to kill one of their own to avert the apocalypse. The four that have shown up have, have seen signs and they all feel convinced that they are are right in their demands and they can't be the ones that kill them. So they have to actually kill their own and it's them trying to decide. And it's, it's two guys and their daughter and they're trying to figure out what do they do? Do they believe this? Do they not? There's some flashbacks to kind of fill in who these people are um, and how they came to be at this cabin and then you get snippets. You get some snippets of news coverage. Could it be planted? Could they be previous, previously recorded snippets? What are they? We don't know. That's up to you. And as the movie builds, it's really trying to see where you where you land on it. It's based on a book. No, Shyamalan uses environment a lot in a lot of his movies. So how much of this is like at the cabin? Is the cabin part of the story? Is it the woods that are the important thing? Like. Why this place? Why did he choose this site? Oh, I'll be for- very clear. You need to remove everything you, you think you know about M. Night. This is the most straightforward movie he's ever done. Like, start to finish. There is no twist ending. There is no twist. None. It is extremely straightforward. So, uh, nothing. It, it's really just a straightforward told suspense tale about the potential end of the world and what decision would you make and would you believe four crazy people that showed up at your house telling you that you had to kill one of your family? Look at you, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> what about Ron Weasley? Is Ron Weasley Ron Weasley, or does Ron Weasley actually act in this one? Uh, Rupert Grant is in it. Uh, it's I can't say much about his performance without giving something away. So the performances are all strong. Here's what I'll say about it. it's it's very straightforward. I don't think the ending is earned. It's a it's a strong enough movie. 
but I will say, I don't know if this is fair or not, but it, you know, it's based on a, on a book called um, The Cabin at the End of the World. And M. Night gave it a different title because he completely wanted to change how it ended. Now, I went after I watched the movie, and I, I enjoyed this movie, but I went and looked up the ending. And I just got done seeing an interview where M. Night was talking about how his movies aren't safe. And I disagree. I, I think this movie was kind of safe. But when I saw the ending that was in the book, which sounds amazing in a very missed kind of way, <laughs> that made me a little bit more bummed with the movie. Is that fair? I don't know if it's fair, but that's what happened. Yeah, it's got the Defending Jacob kind of moniker yes, where they changed yeah. just, yep. just enough of the ending to make you go, that really wasn't that great. Yep, where the but, ending just is more of a whiff. And Defending Jacob, man, did they whiff that one, right? The ending of the book is awesome, yeah. but whatever. Yeah, so it, it definitely changed my opinion of the movie once I realized just how safe it kind of is. So do you think that's M. Night being M. Night and his hubris? Or do yes. you think that they had to do it that way for the movie because it's a true adaptation no, from it's, book to movie? it's M. Night. It, it was totally, he wrote it. He took full responsibility for changing it. He thought he had a better ending. He was just wrong. So if ten dollars is the full price of admission, what would you give Knock at the Cabin? I give it six bucks. I I enjoyed it. It was very intense. I just the ending is a is a bit of a miss. And Batista, I really think it's worth seeing him kind of expand. Cool, cool. Big fan of that guy. So any uh recent film or TV recommendations we haven't already talked about, guys, you want to mention before we move on? Yeah, I've been watching the Mayfair Witches, which is on uh, AMC, I believe it is, and uh, stars Alexandra Daddario as uh, Rowan Fielding, and she is one of the, or she finds out she is one of the Mayfair Witches, which is a whole clan of witches that live in um, Louisiana, Baton Rouge area, you know, the whole the, that, that that whole fun thing that has. Uh, it's all based off a story by Anne Rice, and it is it is pretty fun and interesting. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into when I first watched it or started watching it, but the story to it is pretty solid. I can't wait to see where else it goes. We think we're about four episodes in, give or take. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I did run through all of the '90s show. I did you the first really? Ep- I thought the first episode actually was the worst episode with all the cameos. It just made everybody seem like they were trying too hard, but the show gets a little more endearing as it goes along and you get to see red and kitty as grandparents uh, to these kids. Um, They ended up really liking it by the end of the run, which is good. Um, Also how I met your father is back for season two and there's a great cameo uh, in the first episode. Um, if you'd like the, how I met your mother and survive the first season of how I met your father season two so far is knocking it out of the park so far. Yeah. Season two is doing pretty well. I, I still don't know why I'm watching the show because I can't possibly be rewatching it for all the right reasons. So, uh, and I'm definitely watching it for all the wrongs, but I am enjoying myself while that's happening, but not in a weird way. Hey, and both of your shows have been renewed for season two, Mayfair witches and that 90s show. Yeah. Yeah. So congratulations to both of you. Gang, gang, bitch. I don't know what that meant. Okay. Um, Poker Face. I've been watching Poker Face. It finally came out. There's like uh, six or seven episodes at the time you hear this out now. Man, Natasha Leone is is an actress that I have really not followed since American Pie. Her voice does drive me nuts for a little bit, <laughs> but she is basically Columbo. She's a, she's a living bullshit detector, and she can tell when people are lying. And she's going – it's a case by – it's a every week is its own case. So it's a case of the week style show where she is going from town to town, Incredible Hulk style, solving murders. And she's wonderful. She grows on you. She is like crack now to me. I mean, I'm just, I'm watching, I'm just enjoying every second she's in frame. I love how the show plays out. It starts with the murder for like 10 minutes every episode. And there's, you'll get a sense of where her character of Charlie fits in to the whole world for that week, but you can't, it's not concrete and you don't find out until she enters the picture about 10, like after the first act and then starts putting, she starts putting pieces together to who the murderer is and how they did it. It's, it's really, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's on Peacock. First, first thing on Peacock, I've been impassioned to watch. Probably got some use out of that Comcast subscription. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Now let's take it away. Now let's go to our, from the outside in topic. Mm-hmm. 
Why are we so obsessed about the apocalypse? Everything is apocalypse anymore. So let's let's start there. Walking Dead, Station Eleven, I Am Legend, Last of Us, Knock at the Cabin. We apparently love the apocalypse. People just love it. Why, Troy? Why do we love the end of the world? Do we hate people that Edu- much? Yeah, they they do it for education. Huh? Education. They want to know basically if this is actually going to happen. How do I survive? So they keep watching this stuff because they're taking notes. You really believe that? I don't. <laughs> no. Okay. No. Seriously, I think what all of it stems from uh, the the age of the people that are currently like watching this stuff and are in that, you know, 18 to 49, 25 to 54 demographics, right? They're all survivors of the Cold War. For over 20 years, we lived with the threat of nuclear disaster and all those people like they're now the ones that are spending dollars. So they're just trying to figure this out. And when you think about the kids of those people, they've literally survived like three crises of their own between nine 11 and the financial collapse and the pandemic. So people just want answers to like, what if some disaster happens? And that's why we're so obsessed with this concept of how things are going to fall apart. I mean, to echo that a little bit, a lot of it, I think also comes from the idea that as a sociological experiment we like to watch things that scare us we like to watch things that make us sad and a lot of these things do that to some degree they they make it they put us in a mindset in which we will have to put ourselves in a position where we are we are in this situation and that is part of entertainment it's part of entertainment to explore those parts of our brain and those parts of who we are to figure out at least in this safe space what how far we're willing to go how far far we're willing to accept things the kind of life we're going to end up living if it goes into that there's a lot that goes into why we do it i think it's a it's an interesting experiment we play with ourselves do you guys ever think about that how far you would go in this environment like how far especially when you see you know joel and last of us he's willing to kill people rick grimes was pushed to murder left and right do you do you wonder how far you could go in this kind of scenario to survive I've actually figured out how far exactly I want to go, which is pandemic happens. Uh, five minutes later, I'm laying down in front of a car. You just went out? Is that what you're saying? I'm not going to survive that. I'm too cute and too nice to survive any of that. I'll be somebody's bitch. Some Somebody's... Uh, I'll be... It, it'll be Master Blaster. Some little freaking asshole will be pushing me around hey go kill him i'm like okay i'll go kill him <laughs> you know and master blaster for those who don't know is from um a character uh, two characters actually from uh mad max beyond thunderdome and it's this little old guy and a guy with a uh, questionable intelligence level i think of all that nobody really cared about the master blaster but thanks for elaborating so well you- i care now that he called himself kind of dumb <laughs> I, I know who I am. Some some little is going to boss me around and I'm going to be like, okay, can I have snack now? And they're going to be like, yeah, first go choke him out. I'm like, okay, I'll go choke him out now, boss. I want to live that life. John's running around, Hodor, Hodor. <laughs> um, well, I would say I, I love backpacking. I love backpacking. It's it's getting lost in the quiet of nature and relying on myself to survive. And that is part of backpacking. You have to have all the essentials on you. And it's a, it's addicting if you... It Well, one, you have to really enjoy the outdoors. And I never used to. It's just I came to appreciate it once I went out and did it and found myself kind of immersed in quiet and nature and my own thoughts and actually being able to ponder because I don't think people realize how much you stop thinking with today's world because of technology and whatnot. Our brains are always going a mile a minute. You don't actually have time to stop and process. So I... I love that concept. So whenever this scenario comes up, I love that portion of that's what I'm focused on. Man, that would be great to just have nothing but quiet to to rest my brain for for a while. I've had enough. While you sleep with one eye open. Once you do it and you do it well on on your own, you realize it's nice to not deal with people. You know, you guys are all good. You guys are fine. I'm talking the assholes who cut in line, talk on their phone at movies, those guys. It's nice to not have them around. And that's why I think the those who pay for the cheat seats and then go ahead and steal the expensive seats. Anyway, that's why the apocalypse entices me. Uh, Plus, it causes me to wonder what I would do, how I would handle a scenario like that. Whenever I'm watching, you know, Walking Dead or I'm watching Apocalypse, it isn't like other movies. You know, if I'm watching 
Lethal Weapon, right? I love those. Or Indiana Jones. I'm not thinking what would I do in that scenario because to me it just seems implausible and it's entertainment. But when I watch the apocalypse, for whatever reason, I believe it's possible mostly because I know mankind are assholes and I grew up in the era of the day after where nuclear war was constantly looming over your shoulder. I've thought about that most of my life. What would I do? And especially for being a backpacker for 20 years, like I have skills that I know could benefit me. So it's even more interesting to me. Like, well, I could really, I could finally put them to use. Everybody thinks they're a wasted skill. <laughs> now I actually can benefit my a few select people that I take with me. Would you call them a certain set of skills? Yeah, it's very specific, actually, set of skills. But, <laughs> but, but you're not wrong with the day after, because I mean, that movie like shook people, especially people that saw it when we saw it at our age. Like I purposely make sure that when I buy my house that I am more than 12 miles from a target because that's how far the nuclear blast went in the, in that movie was 12 miles. And that like stuck with me like from childhood on, like I kept cutting off city blocks going like, am I 12 miles away from downtown? Cause I want to make sure I stay 12 miles away from downtown as much as possible. Yeah. And you remember that when we were kids, we would have drills to prepare for like nuclear yeah. fallout. And I'm like, what do you think's going to happen? We're all going to die. That's what's going to happen. Hiding under the desk is not going to do anything to protect me. The, lock, the locker room is not a place that I want to stay to survive for 80 years. Oh, that would stink. It'd be just rancid. All that sweat. Jock straps everywhere. Ugh. But yeah, that's what we grew up with. We grew up with, in the in the late 70s, early 80s, the threat of nuclear war was still eminent. Like, it was still prominent. And, you know, up until the Soviet Union fell, I mean, it was really still there. So I think... I can't speak for you guys, but for me personally, it's always been on my mind. What would I do in a scenario where my house is gone or it's a Red Dawn scenario where you just got parachuting Ruskies or whatever coming in to take over your town? Like, what do you do? How do you survive? It's actually a really interesting, different concept. Um, I think it was called Dragon Day was the name of the movie. And it was basically because all of our technology is dependent on chips and stuff from China like China flipped the switch and basically controlled all technology. And that's how they took over banks, crushed the United States. Oh, wow. And so all these people were out in the woods and they had to figure out how to communicate with like landline telephones and typewriters and anything that was non-tech in order to take back the country. So it's a different kind of apocalypse in that way. Well, we all know what the solution to that scenario is, is you call Chuck Norris. Right. There's also a, it's kind of like uh, Rush, not Russia's, but um, Australia's own Red Dawn uh, situation. There's tomorrow when the war began. It's kind of the same thing where uh, all of a sudden all the technology in Australia kind of just shuts down, and here comes China just running them over. Well, you don't want that. Don't want them running them over. Started with one balloon. <laughs> don't, don't, don't feed that. It, was, it, it. it wasn't the '99 red balloons. <laughs> This damn balloon. If I have to hear one more thing about this stupid balloon, I'm going to lose my mind. One. One balloon only. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> there were a hundred. I like, I like how you almost, you almost did the, the Sean Connery voice for that, because I knew exactly what you did. <laughs> one ping only. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite example of a show or movie capturing your vision of the apocalypse? What movie or show like shows what you think it would be like? Uh, you know, as far as um, all right, so movies movies are concerned. So uh, one of my favorite movies when it comes to a post apocalyptic world is Waterworld. I mean, you talk about how you like being quiet and alone mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. It doesn't get much more quiet than. Uh, Kevin Costner going around on that catamaran like he owns the place like that gets that's pretty nice I I, I would be burnt to Chris because I, I I have kind of fair skin and me and the son don't get along well however that would be a great life I don't view you as a drink your own pee kind of guy yeah I don't mm -mm. you're kind of bougie man I mean if I have a choice that would be the one I'd go for because at least I can see everyone coming at me fair enough okay. you know but as far as like, no, you can't change TV your answer shows. just because we we gave you shit about it. You have to live with it. You're going to drink pee. That's well, no, your freaking about. I was going to give you a TV show and a movie. Oh, I didn't say both. I said or. But okay, go ahead, get greedy. All right. 
so I'm gonna go ahead and go ahead and be greedy. My my favorite idea for post apocalyptic world for a TV show is Firefly. I don't mind the idea of the That's world about to burn up. It's not a post apocalyptic world. It totally is a post apocalyptic world. The hell it is! World. They're flying around all over the place. They got a spaceship. How is it pocus? Everywhere they go, there's civilization, and they're doing fine. They're, they they're stealing left goods. Earth. There is no more Earth. That's why they're not on Earth anymore. That's what the story of it is. The story of 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 Firefly that is that the Earth explodes, but before it explodes, everyone left and and started colonizing the rest of the of the solar system. I don't. Okay. I mean, it's your it's your pick. So I'm just going on record. Do not think it's post apocalyptic. But you go ahead. Troy, you gonna weigh in here? Uh, yeah, I'm saying it's somewhere between the Postman. So apparently, Kevin Costner is the end of the world, <laughs> and um, Station Eleven. Uh, I think those are the most realistic versions of what could actually happen without zombies or aliens interfering. Um, Postman is for those that don't know, takes place like after World War Three has happened, and people are trying to figure out like how to survive. Uh, you know, crazy gangs, you know, come up and. People are just trying to like make the United States whole again. And in station 11, there's a, a pandemic and it takes place between the pandemic starting and 20 years later. And I think that those are the ways that we can see like what would be the worst of us at the initial onset and then how we could potentially get through that 20, 30 years down the road. Um, I think my, um, I really just went for TV show and it's, it's a world I could thrive in. It's, Walking Dead, or I guess I Am Legend, if you want to have both. I mean, I just, I really feel like I'd be fine in that world. I know a lot of people would hate that. It just sounds dire and everything else, but it's the apocalypse. Everything's dead. I would rather know that I, most of the dead people, I can move around. I can get around them. They walk slow. It's really not that. Why they made it such a big deal in the show, I don't understand. It's pretty easy to avoid them. <laughs> because they climb now. Yeah. I just feel like I would be fine. Find all the canned goods I can, find all the supplies I can get, go up into the mountains, build myself a little cabin, and be fine. Problem solved. What's the worst example? Like, what the hell were they thinking? 2012? <laughs> That's pretty awful. 2012 is like the worst movie ever. That's pretty awful. Great. The, I really enjoyed that The one. fate of the world's in junk, USAC's hands. Oh, wait. No. I was... I got I got my my got my two worlds my two movies confused because there was another one around the same time. You're right. 2012 was terrible. I was confusing that with the uh, Dennis Quaid one. That was pretty. The day okay. after tomorrow. The day after tomorrow. Right. Which wasn't an apocalypse. It was just a superstorm. Well, we uh, well, that might have... we've established that John does not understand what post-apocalyptic means. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> What is a superstorm that destroys a huge part of the world? That's that is that is there's a massive change. That is what an apocalypse is. A huge massive change. No, that's called an ice age. Yeah. <sighs> <sighs> no Mad Max, nobody's going for Mad Max. Nobody Well, that wouldn't be worse. That's a great movie, but I would I I mean I mentioned it at the top of the show. I would not want to live in Mad Max. I would be bad. I would be terrible at it. I would be the worst. My my worst example, I honestly think, is the George Romero verse. All of them. Because if you go watch those movies, and don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking the movies, they're entertaining, blah, 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 blah. But every one of those movies is stacked with this really strong plan to outlast the zombies, thwarted by the most idiotic decisions you could possibly make. There's always some dumbass who is in the group that screws it up for everybody in every one of those movies. You have to know your group, man, and you have to be willing to cut some weaknesses from your group. And if you can't do that, you don't deserve to live in the apocalypse. I would cut losses. I'm just saying. I have no problem cutting losses. This, my kids are going to die because you do something stupid. Guess what, stupid? You're done. Got to cut the dead weight. Can't save them all. And George Romero movies? We see Troy. Always. One of us would be dead in five seconds with that, that his, his plan. We wouldn't, we wouldn't make it. You wouldn't. You just said you'd run in front of a car and just let it hit you. As, as a You're parent, right. I would. Everybody's because... still driving in the apo- in your apocalypse because you can't understand what an apocalypse is. It's the first five minutes. People don't know how to drive in the first five minutes of the apocalypse. Of course I'm going to get run over. I'm not going to be, what I'll if be trying to save somebody's life. What if you think it's the apocalypse, but really, really just the power went out? Fuck, you just I... dove in front of a car for no reason. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are we forgetting the part where, where the guy shows up at the place and says, okay, you can... You, it, we are all going to survive this if one of you kill. Stab, 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 Troy. 
I don't have time for, for waiting for the rest of the story. I just want to get through it if I can uh, or man. under it if it comes. So how would you handle the apocalypse? I think we know how John would handle it. Jumps in front of a car. Yeah. You right. kill me. Troy, what about you? I would either kill Troy or, you know, I'd be like, hey, Aaron, look, I did a good thing. Troy's dead. Stop it. That's not, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm all for Wally. Just put me on a spaceship, make me all fat and happy. Put me in my chair. I'm good. You think you'd be fine in an apocalypse, or do you feel like you'd be dead? That's fine. No, well, I'd be I'd be on a spaceship and getting fat be on in a the chair. Spaceship. The Wally's right. He'd be yeah. he'd be like I'd be trying my the worst blue. nightmare. It's the new red. Is living that life. So you don't have a spaceship. Would you be fine <laughs> in an apocalypse right now? The bomb happened. Everything's decimated except for, like, obviously there's some places you could go for food and shelter and all that. Do you think you'd be fine or would you struggle? No, I'd be fine. Yeah, I would too. John, why would you just quit? I mean, really, just grab some gear and that's all you got to get some essentials like a flint, a flashlight, some clothes, some canned hey, goods. you know what? I I just spent the last year and a half of my life isolated on the side of a mountain and I still had some creature comforts. I am not going to make it. <laughs> When I don't have Jesus. some creature comforts, Jesus. when I don't have reliable Stand toilet next to a paper, Walmart or something, and just go raid it every you know, now and again. I, if I can't have a good hot shower, or at least a good shower, not even a good hot shower, just a good shower, at least one in the morning and one at night, I get really cranky. Uh, if I start, if I can smell myself, this is a problem. You're the one that moved back to Florida. Hey, I'm fine. I just don't like that. I don't. I don't. I don't. I just don't, Troy. I, it's just not going to be a life for me. I'll go find a boat and go live out in the ocean someplace. If that's the if that if my choices are let how a does, bus park on my chest wait, or get a boat and live in the ocean, I'm going to go with either one of those. Whichever happens first, I don't care. How does that work? There are you going to fish all the time? Are you going to be a master fisherman? That's the only food you're going to be able to eat is fish. I I I can catch a good ass fish. Really? Can you? Yeah. Okay. Swedish ones. <laughs> <laughs> I can catch all sorts of fishies. I can I can get the one with the the thingy and the like. I, I can the one that does the whole like. Stop hey, look, I'm a You're crab. Done. That one. Is that how many fish on those dating apps have you caught? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Listener comments. Great time to move on. Wow. <laughs> you said you wanted to kill me. <laughs> we posed the question in our Facebook group. <laughs> that was just hurtful. Why do you people okay. love the apocalypse? <laughs> Fucking listen! Why do people love yes, the apocalypse? Yes. Is is Aaron talking still? <laughs> David Kenning. Someone's comment. David, David Kenning says, "Not sure, but have but always have been. Maybe it's because I'm an '80s kid and grew up learning to hide. See, there's another one. Learning how to hide under my desk for fear of nuclear war. I remember sneaking upstairs to watch the day after. Man, that was huge, right? That was like the only TV movie we could reference from the '80s, but it was impactful." Um, when it premiered on TV, I just had to watch it. Since then, I've read or watched just about anything that deals with it. If you want to get really dark, a lot of us are this way about the Holocaust also. It's just so dark and hideous, it, re- it, it demands studying. It's horrifically fascinating, and I can't tell you how many books I've read dealing with it. That's true, because, I mean, for a large portion of people over there in Germany and whatnot, and in Europe, that was quite an apocalypse. For, for many of them. I mean, that could happen again. Something horrible like that could happen again. Even just the two world wars alone taking place in Europe. Mm-hmm. Just the trauma from all that. I mean, just look at what's happening in the Ukraine. That could happen. That could happen here, you know, and it's, it's a different world. It's crazy. Not trying to bring anything down, but you know, go ahead and make jokes, John. Speaking of not bringing anything down, Becky Trumbo says the apocalypse is a universal nightmare. It's our world but wrong. Gives us half humans like in the Night of the Comet or demolished underwater cities and landmarks. It's intense to dance that close to a nightmare. And I, I really agree with that comment. That's what that's that's where I I land on this. This is why we enjoy it, because it gives us that thrill to be that close to disaster without but with that a huge safety net of not really being there. Well, Reese Bennett said, the way the world is, it seems inevitable that a dystopian apocalypse could arrive at any time. Mm -hmm. Run to Walmart now. We all want to watch how people will adapt to survive it and imagine what we would do in that same circumstance. You know what's sad about that and also interesting about that comment is we kind of got a glimpse, didn't we, in 2020 of how people would react? 
They fight. Well, co- we, like, we got I, a glimpse of that, and we're constantly seeing how the world's going to turn into ha- Handmaid's Tale for a lot of us. You know, there's a lot of things about the last couple of years that really scare us, and um, and there are some people who are like, "Yeah, give me that, bring it on," and that's what makes it worse. I went out and bought a bidet because there just was no toilet paper. <laughs> oh my god! I, still got, I I I just remembered. I need to go get a bidet for my place now. I know. The it's the greatest happened? thing I ever bought. Thank you, pandemic, for cleaning. I my really, butt. I, I can't wait till I can pressure wash my butthole. <laughs> well, my advice to the world is: if you want to know who to take when the real apocalypse happens, go back to 2020 and figure out who freaked out the most. You want to avoid those people because yeah. they're going to make your life harder. They bought oh, yeah. toilet well, paper instead it wasn't of me. buying canned food. <laughs> yeah. They push down old ladies just to get the toilet paper instead of the food, you know. I, and then they went and posted themselves press, proud little pictures of them with their toilet paper thrones, being like, "Look at all the toilet paper I have! I have all the toilet paper." Get those people out of your life. They're just going to make it harder for you to live. Those are the people you're talking about when you say uh, you're going to kill them, right, Aaron? Mm 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 mm. I said I said I would take care of weaknesses. That's what I said. I didn't say people could be varmints in the in the uh-huh back field clearly their weakness was toilet paper and they will run out eventually yeah yeah because i'm gonna take it from it i'm gonna take it back um, i'm i'm gonna load up on toilet paper and cigarettes because so th- th- those two things will become current i just love that that was the priority not food for the end of the world we're gonna get toilet paper yeah hey you know what like if you get an itch- itchy asshole once I, that's enough i get you all right that's more than enough. You know what? Share your thoughts on this episode or anything else in our Facebook group or on Twitter or at by popcorn. Our site is the HollywoodOutsider.com. I got nothing else. You can rate and subscribe. I'm us. spent, Jack. <sighs> heavy sigh. Heavy sigh, heavy sigh. Okay, that's it for the show. Remember, the next time you head to a theater or stream comfortably on your couch, buy popcorn. I just want to know, like, the episode before Valentine's Day, and you talk about an itchy asshole. Like, that's your priority? Uh, you know, that's also the priority of some other people on Valentine's Day. Right, Troy? What the f- <laughs> He's got a bidet. His asshole isn't itchy. <laughs> My squeaky clean. <laughs>